This talk is a compilation of lots of people, but my longtime colleague and friend Praveen Javadi is the most important. Uh, has joined me in the team. That's that's kind of the Mac. You have to use the keyboard. The keyboard. Yeah, on the, the PC. <coughs> Um, I've worked with everyone who's ever been interested in antifungals or diagnostics, um, and I sort of lost track of how many CDAs I've signed over the years. But to, for a complete disclosure, I also have a whole bunch of coaching T-shirts from years of coaching my kids' uh, sports, and one point someone gave me a whistle. I don't think I ever returned. <laughs> so let's talk about fear, because that's really why you're here, right? So what are clinicians really worried about? What are they worried about today? What are they worried about tomorrow? And how do you take the science of discovery and marry it with the art of medicine, okay? Um, so what is it that keeps me up at night and when I'm on call? It's not gram-positive infections. It's crazy resistant gram-negative infections. It's not CMV, it's not adenovirus. It used to be, but Brin Sadafir sort of changed that. It's yeast somewhat, it's molds, and it's crazy molds. It's molds that, that I have to look up on Google. Um, it's molds also like Sketosporium prolificans, which treat, nothing treats. Fire is the treatment for Sketosporium prolificans. So you look at sort of the question of, what is it that's really bothering me and literally keeping me up at night? It's sort of these molds. So as you're looking for drug discovery, don't forget the molds and don't forget the sort of rarer, what we call rarer molds as they expand out there. So this is what your neighbors in your, in your neighborhoods think about fungi when they ask us, what do you do for a living? And you explain to them and they go, what? What, what, are, you, what are you talking about? Um, this is unfortunately what I see sort of most weeks and we see some of the major players over here. We've heard about some of these throughout the, throughout the conference as well. So this is a true story as to why I'm here. So Wen Long, I can't give you his last name because I would violate every rule of confidentiality, who was born on May 4th, that's my birthday. He was an eight-year-old boy at Stanford, and in August of 1998, I was a brand new physician. I started in July at Stanford, so I was, this was literally my second rotation. He had a really bad type of leukemia, underwent a bone marrow transplant, had a CT scan. This is stolen from Stanford, don't mind, mind you. The, this is his CT scan. This is the CT scan that got me to this point. I remember this day, literally. This is Wenlong, and these are the aspergillus he had right over here. These were the comments I got from the attendings in, in infectious diseases of what to do in 1998. They're, they're miserable, you can read them all. You see, we used to use things like rifampin, which is obviously a TB drug, because we sort of thought it might have worked in there. Wenlong passed away, I aged, um, but he changed my life. So, the IDSA, Infectious Disease Society of America, published mandates, and they do this every now and then, of like, what are the really bad guys out there? And of course, MRSA and enterococcus and things like that, and aspergillus. And you see the quotes here they made about aspergillus specifically, of this is a really bad disease, and there's not really anything on the market. And there's not really anything, sort of anything coming. <coughs> so the question is, how do you improve the treatment of aspergillosis? And this is the guidelines that we published a few years ago. And I'm on the committee to redo them and we're working on them right now, of like, okay, what do you actually do? And we have a lot of Me Too drugs that work somewhat but don't really make any big changes. So we learned a little about a calcineurin. I won't go into everything that Suchan's talked about here, but you see the pathway here of, well, maybe this is a newer, newer approach. So this, is, this was a quick experiment done about 10 years or so ago that looked at basically caspofungin, you know, and, and a couple different immunosuppressors over here, and you see, wow, this actually works pretty well. I mean, just right out of the box. These immunosuppressors work against aspergillosis. And so I took some samples, a small study again, of uh, patients who are transplant recipients. So these patients are on FK506 as part of their graph, graph, graph suppression issues, and non-transplant patients. These are aspergillus isolates from transplants and essentially leukemia patients. And you see basically the MICs and stuff to the, to the um, calcium inhibitors don't change. In other words, this is an awful target to approach if the patient who's on the inhibitor has developed some sort of resistance if the isolate changes, and you see it doesn't right here. So of course we've done lots of different gene knockouts in aspergillus. Here's of course the, the first one. You learned about the calcium A catalytic unit from Suchan a minute ago, and we see that, well, it stops the growth. And you add a couple other different drugs like nicomycin or caspofungin, you see the changes over here when you do, by this time you're doing triple therapy, right? Calcineurin, chitin, and glucan synthesis, and you just have unrecognizable blebs that don't really grow at all. So we've, tr we've turned it on and off the calcineurin gene. You can sort of rev it up and rev it down, and you see it's really quite related to, to growth. I mean, suppressing this gene directly suppresses hyphal growth. So the question is, how do you interpret this data this far? And I'll give you three of my most uh, important articles that have influenced my scientific career. Here's one of them. This is in Nature. There's a concern in West Germany over the falling birth rate, and the accompanying graph might suggest a solution. This is literally published in Nature. Obviously, it's a joke. 
They, they showed they graphed storks and they graphed babies. They said, well, this is your answer. This is why there's a falling birth rate. There's less storks. So always be careful how you're interpreting your data that you have so far. This is what we want to do. We want to figure out how can we inhibit in a targeted fashion the calcineurin pathway to affect cell wall biosynthesis, eventually hypho growth, and eventually virulence. Knowing, starting with some guys right over here that we know we have here. But it's a question of a targeted passion. I, I, I'm a viable eukaryote. I'd like to stay viable. So how do you not inhibit my IL-2? How do you not inhibit my calcineurin pathway, but that of the eukaryote infecting me? So we did some great work looking at, well, where is calcineurin? And we see that calcineurin is localized at the septa in growing hyphae. So this is obviously unique to more to mold pathogens. And you see very closely a sort of a disc. You'll see it on both ends. It's stable. So as the septa grows and more and more hyphae are laid down, you, you still have calcineurin staying there. You also look at um, calcineurin A and calcineurin B. One's, one's labeled green, one's labeled red. And they're both at the hyphal tip and at the septa. And they're stable there. So the points of sort of where the fungus is growing, sort of the business end of the fungus, is where calcineurin is staying and sitting there. I'm not going to show you a movie, but you see how calcineurin also has a retrograde movement from the top to the bottom to sit at the septa. So we have a lot of, we have a lot of work in our lab on the hyphal tip and a lot of work on the septa, sort of like these are, these are the scaffolds of how this thing grows. Because if you stop growth of this pathogen, you stop the disease. So we've deleted several genes, of course, and we're just throwing a few of them here, calcineurin A, calcineurin B, of course, a double mutant over here. And you see that the anomalies that happen with both the hyphal tip and the septa. I mean, these septas are just, just bizarre. We have some that don't, that don't even go all the way to one side. Um, so you see calcineurin focusing on the growth. So moving towards targeting, how, how do we take this and go to something else? Well, if the, if the end goal is to put this into patients, um, be careful how you design everything. Another favorite, favorite patient of mine. Parachute use has never been formally studied. It's a fact. The perception that parachutes are a successful intervention is anecdotal. There are cases, if you look at the references in this article, of people that have fallen out of large buildings and not died. When they should have had a parachute, but they didn't die. So they're proposing studies are required to calculate the balance of risks and benefits of parachute use. There's a very large consent form that's outside if you want to sign up for this particular study. <laughs> so how do you move toward targeting? Well, so you learned a little bit from Suchan before. Here's calcineurin A. This is the four main domains of calcineurin A, so the catalytic unit. So you have the catalytic part of it, the calcineurin B binding helix, calmodulin, and this autoinhibitory arm that comes in there. So after a whole bunch of different mutations, we've, we sort of centered on the blue region right over here, which is a little linker between these two guys over here. You see that right over here? And inside, the, which I put in red to make it easy, is something we creatively call the serine proline rich region because it has a whole lot of serines and a whole lot of prolines. Okay, so you see the, the red inside the blue over there. So even from back where you are, you can sort of see the B binding helix and the chemogen domain are pretty conserved. The linkers on various different fungal species are just all over the map. So the linker is the difference. Everything else is really, really quite conserved. So if you break it down to look at just the SPRR region that we called over here, and you sort of break fungi into different groups over there, you see the molds have more serines and prolines. As you sort of go to the yeast and go to different other species, it sort of dissipates and breaks apart. Most importantly, I have none right over here. Okay, so this is sort of the evolution, and I'm not going to show you the, the tree, but you get the idea of this is sort of lumping the molds together. So a lot of great work here. In fact, Su Chen helped us out here. These are mucor, the ABC genes you just talked about. Essentially, this SPRR region, which is a little more sort of, sort of C-terminal, what we did in here is we took Aspergillus. OK, this, this is the native one. This is the wild type right over here. For right in this strain right here, we took the Cryptococcus calcineurin gene and put it into our Aspergillus mutant. So you have Aspergillus strain, but Cryptococcal calcineurin A is sort of slopped in there. And you see that it doesn't really grow. And, and if you happen to look back over here, it's because, well, there's really not much conservation here. Not much there at all. As you can see, but if we took this over here and we said, well, let's do a chimera, where we're actually going to have sort of the, the C-terminal end of Aspergillus with the N-terminal part of Cryptococcus. The C-terminal part has the, has the SPRR in it linked together, and that goes into our Aspergillus mutant. Now, all of a sudden, it grows. You're essentially, and you see things over here, you're essentially showing that the SPRR, that particular region, is the important part of calcium A for the growth. Not just the whole gene, this little small section right over here. Magnaporthia and Neurospora have incredible conservation. They grow quite well. So then the question was, well, well there's a lot of serines and prolines here. Why, why are there so many serines and prolines there? 
So we looked at and did some phosphoproteomics to figure out, well, what's happening to them? And what we found is that this SPRR region and the C-terminal region, there's six residues that are phosphorid and aspergillus calcineurin A. Four of them are clustered right here, and two in the C-terminus over there, sort of, sort of much further away. So we have this region over here that we know it's this particular region that's important for the growth, and we'll show you the virulence later on of aspergillus. There's four serines that don't make any sense smashed all together, and they're all phosphorylated. So what does that mean exactly? So then, we, then of course, we made a strain that we call the 4SA strain. So the serines became alanine, so they don't, can't get phosphorylated. Glutamic acid over here, so they can stay phosphorylated. And you see growth issues right over here. Um, you see growth again over here. You, you see um, enzymatic acids over here showing about the calcineurin, and you see the growth more over here. Um, this right over here is something called, the, something called the paradoxical effect. So the paradoxical effect usually works with caspofungin as an echinocandin, and that echinocandin with the aspergillus, paradoxically, at higher concentrations, you have growth. When you think higher concentrations, would keep killing things. Now, there's a long debate over where the paradoxical effect is clinically relevant or not. In other words, can I give patients large doses of caspofungin? Do they have to be worried about it? I'm not going to get into that debate right now. It's clearly a cell wall integrity issue, and it works great in the laboratory as sort of a microbiologic uh, phenomenon. So you see here the paradoxical effect. If I give more caspofungin, I actually have more growth. But if I knock out this over here, I don't have this issue. And we've done this as well with knocking out calcium A, CRZA, calcium B. We sort of see the same issue. So this paradoxical, this cell wall sort of response is driven by this part of calcineurin as well. Here's the virulence assays um, of looking at this 4SA strain right here that has no phosphor, phosphor, phosphorylation. And you see the um, differences there. So again, we talked about this this paradoxical growth over here, and what does this exactly mean? So, so some of the big questions for us are how is it regulated? What about calcium? Calcium is the top of the calcineurin pathway. Is it important for this paradoxical growth? And do echinocandins affect this phosphorylation? This phosphorylation appears important for growth, but how does it, how does it work? What's all the mechanism over here? And is there other differential phosphorylations? Caspofungin and mycofungin. Mycofungin, another echinocandin that doesn't show the paradoxical effect. So how does that work? So, what we're seeing so far is this novel SPRR domain, which, which is really quite unique and not found in me, uh, is uniquely phosphorylated. Uh, and, the, and it stops this hyphal growth. And we're trying to find divergences again between my calcineurin and aspergillus's calcineurin. And maybe this is it. Maybe this is the region right here. So we've done some stage dependent work to say, well, as aspergillus grows, this has been repeated several times, you see more phosphorylation. So the phosphorylation seems important of that little region that I don't have for the hyphal growth, for the virulence over there. It's sort of progressively phosphorylated. Then you look at sort of treatment with caspofungin or mycofungin, okay? So you remember caspofungin has this paradoxical effect. Mycofungin does not. So there's a differential phosphorylation there as well, four micrograms being sort of the higher dose. So you're really comparing this line with this line over here. So interesting sort of you know, data is about to be published of looking at the differential phosphorylation of calcineurin from today's drugs. Paradoxical effect over here, we're talking a little bit more about some work that's in progress looking at um, different amounts of uh, focusing on calcium. So calcium chelators over here, and you, you see a calcium blocker over there, and sort of saying, is calcium inhibiting this growth? So again, the paradoxical effect as a microbiological phenomena of how growth is happening and how calcineurin is controlling it. We looked at some calcium levels with a colleague, Nick Reed, in Manchester, and sort of the same idea. And you, you, see, you see different calcium spikes with the agents that cause the paradoxical effect. So how does this all play together, and how can we move it towards targeting? Okay? So this is sort of one of our big summary slides of figuring out, okay, how does this all come together? And of course, we're working on the phosphorylation. I haven't talked to you about CRZA and how that could play in their role in the, in the CRZA, the usual transcription factor dependent pathways, the non-CRZA dependent pathways. Uh, phosphorylation independent, phosphorylation dependent. There's a big interactome here of how this all works together, clearly with stress response, cell wall integrity, and of course, ultimately over here, growth. Uh, and we haven't even touched on resistance yet, aspergillus resistance. These are some studies we're proposing to do right now, uh, we're going to be getting shortly, of looking at sort of different ways to purify things to understand interactance as well as phosphorylation. So uh, when calcineurin is phosphorylated, is it interacting with different proteins? Is it doing different things? We have data to show, yes, it seems like that's the case. It's activated. It's doing something different. But what is it doing differently? And of course, we're focusing specifically on the SPRR. How does that work out? And as far as phosphorylation, how do we figure out, okay, really understanding what, 
what the phosphoproteomics are showing us. And, there, and there's newer technologies now available that are way above my head to figure out how do we use phosphoproteomics to figure out what's going on. You know, what, what is being phosphorated and what exactly is it doing? So things we're going to end up with here, um, the structure. We're, we're getting it crystallized right now. Calcineur is a, a complicated structure to sort of go as, as, as C-terminal as the SPRR. We're making great progress so, par, so far in some baclovirus strains. Um, understanding this linker. What is the linker doing? Is it physically holding things in space? Or is it somehow relevant for everything else? What else is located at the septum with calcineurin? Calcineurin seems important for septal growth and growth in general. But what's there? What, what, what is it tethered to? And what is it controlling? And most importantly, can we chemically selectively inhibit this SPRR phosphorylation? So it's not so much that we're doing a kinase inhibitor. We're, we want to block the SPRR so the kinase, and we have some data to suggest which ones those are, do, doesn't get there. So we have some fragment-based screening that's going to start shortly to figure out how do we do that? How do we move to the chemical inhibition? We have the, we have the years of biology here. Now we have the target. How do we inhibit this particular part right over here? I'll end with this, another one of my favorite ones, New England Journal. Chocolate consumption equals Nobel Prizes. It's actually very well done statistically, pretty good R value. And you see, Sweden should have a whole lot more. That's a little biased because they have the no actual Nobel. Um, you look at the regression line and you figure, okay, it's, it's a, it's, they tell you how much chocolate you have to eat per capita to get a Nobel laureate. Um, minimum, there's a minimum effective dose right here. There's really, there's, there's, there's a dose response curve. There's really no ceiling. So there's, there's lots to learn from science of how do we actually get this. We're not doing that well over here. Canada's actually worse right down over there. Um, so it's tough. It's tough out there. Lots of people have done lots of different things in my lab over the years. Here's the people that are working with me right now, which are wonderful in the past. And of course, you can't do this without somebody else's money. Thank you very much. <laughs>